well, you said Saul Goodman, so you we have we haven't mentioned actually what you worked on. You mm -hmm. worked on Six Feet uh, Under. You worked for Breaking Bad. You worked for uh, uh, Better Call Saul. You worked for late latest shows, uh, Poker Face, yep. Silo. Uh, Silo. Yep. Uh, I'm binge watching Silo at the moment. Oh, it's so good. The, the Silo is an interesting thing because mm -hmm. I'm binge watching it at the moment. I knew you were coming, so I paid attention a bit. Uh, to the music and then I realized there's not much music going on in silo not not much source there's a lot of score a lot of, sco a lot of yeah. score but then I thought about something mm -hmm. uh, for example one of the artists while you remember the story about the archive that I yeah. typed in you know all those things tags for, yep. this, for the particular artist one of the artists that I discovered by doing that was Brian Eno yes and it's not kind of a mu it's not the kind of music I would to listen to mm -hmm. privately, but when when you are forced to sit down and listen, you learn something. You learn something, something very peculiar about Brand Eno, and then then I realized this music should could easily change score. Yes, absolutely. And I'm guessing there are many situations when those th two things overlap. Mm -hmm. When you when audience think it's a score, but it's not. But it's actually not. Yeah. But you have to put this seamlessly with the with the with the composers. Yeah, um, it's a balancing act, you know. Um, one of my favorite moments in Breaking Bad was a sequence where we had Gustavo Fring, and he was about to confront Hector Salamanca. He's about to kill Hector Salamanca because he thinks that he's ratted him out to the police. And Walter has worked with Hector Salamanca to put a bomb underneath his chair. And that piece before that could easily have been score, right? It's a very powerful moment. Um, it is literally years of simmering rage and revenge. And if you think about who Gustav, Gustavo Fring is, he's a man of control. He's a man of deep intelligence, strategy. He, he, he's, he has so much anger within him, but he keeps it all so tight. And we needed music that captured this feeling, right? And I know that uh, Dave Porter, the composer, also created pieces for this, and I pulled music as well. Frequently in that show, we would both try to cover things. But I knew also that I didn't want to put something in there that made it into a song moment. I needed something that was connected somehow to what Dave does already, and I found a song by an artist named Apparat called Goodbye. There's a beautiful vocal that's tied to it. Soap and Skin does the vocal on it, but we ended up using the instrumental version because it was a little bit more seamless. It made it more in the score realm and it's one of my favorite moments in the series because it takes you into his emotional state completely you're not thinking about it of here's a here's a needle drop here's a song moment it's a moment where you feel the emotion slowly building and moving towards this extraordinary conclusion and those of you who've seen breaking bad know it doesn't end well for gustavo fring or hector salamanca for that matter but it is a very powerful sequence but it has to be done with a certain level of sincerity and respect sincerity to the character and respect to the environment and the culture of the music and the storytelling of how we've done before so that's like an example where it can be in between. Um, for Silo, as a good example, um, Atli Orvason, an Icelandic composer, is the composer for that show. And we had to go through extraordinary difficulty to get him on board because he is based in Iceland and there are tax incentives that push you to hire composers from certain areas. This has become a very common new thing. A lot of film productions are in a spot where they're chasing or pursuing tax incentives. Serbia has been a fantastic beneficiary of this. They make filming here inexpensive because they're tax rebates. So people want to come to Serbia and be able to actually do film productions here. The more film productions happen, the better the crews become, the more talented everybody becomes, the more reliable. And pretty soon you're like, yeah, we're doing scenes that are supposed to be in Greece or they're supposed to be in, in Berlin, but we shot it in Serbia and we're so happy we did because it feels like you're in Berlin. You don't feel like you're not in that city, but at the same time, we're able to afford to do it and we're able to put more money into the scene. We could do a chase scene that we wouldn't have done otherwise, things like that. So for Silo, we had this uh, need to hire a British composer. Atlee was the right composer, partly because the director who did the first few episodes established the tone of the series, had worked with him before, and he had anecdotally fired a whole bunch of other composers that weren't Atlee. So we were like, okay, we need to get somebody he's comfortable with that we can move forward. There was a lot of world building we had done originally for the silo. We were filling entire ideas of how music would work. 
The director was not really interested in that. He was very interested in score and music was not really the focal point. So months and months of work, months and months of ideas got thrown out the window, which was for me absolutely heartbreaking. But I also recognized that my job is to always pivot to the situation as it is, not as I wish it to be. So I wish that there was more world building, but that's not what the show turned out to be. The show turned out to be very plot driven, very score driven. And the job really was to make sure that we created an environment where Atlee was able to do the best storytelling and we were able to identify what are the stories that we're telling. So my job is yeah. really to help with that, identify what story are we telling here and does the audience know this is part of this plot, this is part of this plot, and it's not just a suit. It yeah. has different specific distinct identities. But there's a missed opportunity in Silo that I was thinking about. Mm. Because, for example, they have this whole relics thing going on, yep. right? So they see the paths and they don't know what it is, yeah. what it is. So, which opens up uh, a completely new portal into uh, like shedding light on our world from a different perspective of somebody who's outside of it. Yes. And this could be you can play with it in so many different ways. So imagine if they found a relic with Beatles. Yes. And right. all of a sudden they play and hear the Beatles for the first time. Right. The way this can create so many different, like smaller narratives. You're, you're singing my song. Um, yeah. You know, but that wasn't ultimately I know, what I know. the vision was. So, I know. And if you could know all the wonderful ideas that I had built and that work, we hired a musicologist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We talked about how people misremember music. Yeah. So a melody that might come from Chopin will suddenly get tied to a Cyndi Lauper pop song because they're melodically similar. And suddenly you realize, oh, they're tied to each other, but someone misremembered. And then the lyric is a patriotic song because it had to be adapted to the life in the silo. So now you have almost a folk song from the silo with the melody or the lead line of the Cindy Lauper song, but the structure of Chopin. And you're like, what an incredible, beautiful way of telling how, especially from learned, because we don't have any technology in the silo, right? You don't yeah. have record players. There's no CD players. There's no TVs. Everyone is living a life of, in, it's almost like a feudal engagement. Yeah. So it was kind of like, how does the folk music build? We built all that, but it didn't end up getting used. And yeah. so it's one of those things where you're like, ah, but you know what? You hire me as the craftsperson to build everything as much as possible. And if it turns out that it doesn't make it into the cut for one reason or another, that's okay. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. I did the work. I, I know that you know it's it's there, it's a choice, you know? Yeah, but for Breaking Bad, for example, it's a completely different story. Yes. Breaking Bad is such a good show that now being 42 years old, you know, done a bunch of stuff in my life, one thing you realize. In, it went so much more into that show than just the budget and like hired, hiring good people. Yeah, having time, having budget, and hiring good people, it takes so much. It goes so much more. It seems like a show where everybody gave their best. Yes, everybody gave their best, and there's so much nuances. And when everybody puts an effort in it, you have this symbiotic effect mm -hmm. of creating an effect which none of these particular parts have it for itself. Yeah. Only when they blend to get blend together like in a good harmony. Yes. And uh, I'm guessing, you know, that uh, the being music supervi supervisor for 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 particular episodes for the particular seasons. I don't know how many seasons you did. All of them. Yeah. All you did all of them from all, the beginning. All, from, from the beginning. beginning. Oh, that's nice. Um, so d doing something like that. So you were you I'm guessing you were part of it from the beginning. Mhm. Mm and so there was, you had to develop all of those characters. Yeah. So you're like Jesse Pinkman, like yep. Walter White, they had to be, they are such a colorful, vivid, but very peculiar characters. Yes. So what was the process of building those characters like for you? Well, it's Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul, and now this new project I'm working with Vince is, is to me probably my favorite projects of my lifetime. They, they, are, they are unique circumstances in that from the very start, yeah you have an opportunity to be creative. Um, you're not just hiring me, or they don't just hire me as a craftsperson, they give me the opportunity to be an artist. And I think that is something, but an artist in context, you know, I'm not here to solo. My job is to figure out how little do you need to notice me for me to contribute in an interesting way. And then you can figure out how much volume you wanna put up in that moment. Yeah. Because I was involved from the, from the very beginning, 
one of the things that was very interesting was I met with Vince and the team on my very first meeting with them. And because they were meeting with lots of music supervisors, most of whom had a lot more experience than I did, they had me waiting in the waiting room for a very long time. <laughs> and I just watched all these much more successful music supervisors going out smiling like, I got the job and I got the job. And I just thought like, okay, I'm going to spend my whole afternoon here and they're going to be polite and say, we hired somebody about an hour ago, but we thought we'd at least meet with you. I didn't expect anything of it. But they said, would you watch the episode? And so I've already been there for like an hour and a half. And I was like, sure, no problem. I'll go look at it. And I watched what was probably the most powerful hour of television I'd ever seen, the pilot of Breaking Bad. And I was in awe of it. And they brought me in and they said, well, what did you think? And I said, I, I think it was one of the best hours of television I've ever seen. I, I'm, I'm kind of speechless over it. I, I did not expect it to be at this level. And they said, what do you think of the music? And I said, I didn't like the music at all. Um, and they said, really? And I said, I would literally take it all out. I, I don't think there's one cue I would keep. I would wipe the entire thing clean and start over. And they were like, okay, hot shot. Um, what would you do? And I said, less, less music. It's wall to wall music. You have an incredible performance. You have an incredible story. You have a great premise. You have a really great rhythm to how you're telling that story. You know, you're establishing that he's, you know, he has cancer. You're establishing that he is uh, uh, disrespected at his school. You you see him recognizing that even his brother-in-law, who's a bit of a bully, is basically talking down to him. And then you have that light bulb moment where you see all that money and you think that's the kind of money that they're making. And he knows I have a problem. I'm gonna die, I've got cancer, and I'm gonna solve it with the one thing that I know that I can do, which is chemistry, and I can make that kind of money, I've now solved that problem. That's incredible storytelling in a very short period of time. And then you engage him with Jesse, and you have that entire process, that weird bromance between the two of them that gets built, all this in a one hour thing. But they had music from beginning to end. It was constant wall to wall. And I thought, it's a little bit like a very handsome person putting on too much makeup, you know? Yeah. And you're just like, you're so beautiful. Why are you putting on eyeliner and, and all of these things? You're covering up, you're overcompensating for what is already beautiful. So I would say, get rid of all the makeup. Let's start from scratch. Maybe a little bit of eyeshadow or a little bit of eyeliner, you know? Maybe, you know, a little bit of lipstick. Let's minimize. And I think that they responded very well to that idea because it was the opposite of what everybody else had told them. All of these veteran supervisors all said, the music's amazing, I can't wait to help, it's gonna be great. And they would probably replace those songs with more affordable ones that were also okay. But it would be an hour of television that would be overwhelming and the music would be telling you in every moment how to feel. And I think what we ended up with instead, partly because we had very little money, Two, because I think we realized that we were leaning into every department was doing something magical. Back to what you yeah. said earlier. The, the choices of colors, the choices of the cars, the choices of the actors, how they carried themselves, clothing, everything was so thought through. It's not an accident that Walt starts wearing beige and ends in black. You know, he evolves over the course of time. We would navigate how Jesse was based upon how his clothes would change, how he would carry himself. Yeah. When he gets his old rickety car after his sports car, it's because he's now learning to go underground and stay low key, right? The characters are all evolving over the course of time. Skylar, you see Skylar's um, sort of emotional soul journey through the colors that you see in those shots, how she's framed, all of these are choices. So. When I look at it, I try to look at it with great sensitivity of, okay, the writer has made certain choices. What am I drawing from that? So from the script, I'll put my notes. The, uh, the directors are making certain choices. How do I frame this? If you two are talking, am I on you? Am I on you? Am I on you when he talks? And am I on you when he talks? That's an interesting choice. What can I draw from that? So by pulling all this information together, it tells me how can I help? If the conversation is engaging between the two of you, but there's a caustic energy that neither of you want to you know, touch upon, maybe we have in a cafe a little bit of music in the background. You don't notice it mostly, but when there's a silence between the two of you, it pops in and it has an acrid quality to it. And now we've told in a very subtle way, without you even noticing it, that there's something ugly in this conversation, that there is a domination going on that I didn't notice until the very end when that little piece of music said, yeah. if you didn't catch it, there's something kind of ugly happening. And that's sort of what we can do. We find subtle ways of contributing and helping. And then of course we had these incredible montages where we'd have 
storytelling of like, here's a week that goes by in the process of making this meth batch, or here's where Jesse goes from being um, a, a, a flunky student to a teacher because he's teaching, you know, Badger how to make it, you know? <laughs> and it's funny and it's fun. And yeah. the songs would really help the audience feel like this is a tone. Here we're being comedic, here we're being light, here we're being darker, here we're being a bit more mysterious. And we would find these really wonderful ways of working with the editors to build these beautiful montages. It's, it's again, it's, it's, a, it's such a joy to be able to work with a team that everybody is doing their very best work and all you can do is screw it up. So you just yeah. try to find a way not to. 